so this is lecture 9 of A2 metric spaces. In the last lecture we introduced the concept of an open set and in this lecture we're going to see how the notion of continuous can be recast in the language of open sets. So we'll spend a little while on this, first of all looking at continuity at a single point and then at continuity on the whole space. And we'll look at continuity at a single point first. Now for this we need to introduce the notion of neighbourhood. Uh, I personally don't really use the language of neighbourhoods uh, and it will only appear in this quite small part of the course. So this is the definition of a neighbourhood. Let x be a metric space and suppose I've got a subset z of x. And let little z be in that subset big z. So we say that big z is a neighbourhood of little z if there is some open ball about little z that's also contained in big z. So if there's some delta greater than zero such that the open ball of radius delta about little z is contained in big z. So certainly any open set that contains z is a neighbourhood of z. So that follows straight away from the definition of open set because if, if I've got an open set u that contains a point z, then it, by definition it also contains a ball about z. However, neighbourhoods don't have to be open sets. Um, it can be away from close by to the point little z, it could be anything. It could be sort of highly uh, closed, sort of discrete set. It doesn't have to be open at all. So that's the definition of a neighbourhood. There's no requirement that a neighbourhood itself be an open set. Now the reason for introducing this notion of neighbourhood is that it turns out that one can cast what it means for a function to be continuous at a point in terms of neighbourhoods. So here is the key proposition in that regard. Let's take two metric spaces x and y and let f from x to y be a map. And then suppose I've got a point a in x. Then the statement is that f is continuous at a if and only if the following is true. For every neighbourhood n of f of a, so that's a subset of y, um, and by definition let's just remember it's a subset of y that contains an open ball about f of a. So the statement is that f is continuous at a if and only if for every neighbourhood n the pre-image f inverse of n is a neighbourhood of a. Okay, so let's just take a moment or two to make sure we understand the statement. f inverse of n is the language that we use for the pre-image of n under the map f. So what that means is the set of all points in x which when you map them under f, so f of them, lies in n. So it's a notation, we don't mean to suggest that f inverse is itself a map, so f need not be an injective bijective map, it need not have an inverse. So that's just notation meaning the pre-image of n. So indeed a given point could have several pre-images. Okay so this is the statement, it is a re an equivalent way of saying what it means to be continuous at a point A, but you'll see that there's no notion of distance explicitly mentioned. It's all done in terms of neighbourhoods. And we'll give the proof of this on the next slide. Uh, it's somewhat long the way I've written it, but it, it's if you think about it the right way, it ends up being almost a tautology. Okay, so let's look at the proof. Let's look at the only if direction first. Suppose that f is continuous at A. Now let's let n be a neighbourhood of f of a, and let's recall what that means. That means that n contains some open ball about f of a. So let's say that that open ball has radius epsilon. n contains that ball. Now by continuity, the usual definition of continuity, there's a delta greater than zero, such that if x lies in the ball of radius delta about a, in other words, if the distance from x to a is less than delta, then f of x lies in the ball of radius epsilon about f of a. In other words, the distance from f of x to f of a is less than epsilon. So that's just the definition of continuity. And what this means, if you think about it, is that f inverse of that ball of radius epsilon about f of a contains the ball of radius delta about a, because f of anything in that ball of radius delta about a lands up in the ball of radius epsilon about f of a. And therefore we have the following chain of inclusions. So on the right here 
we've got the inclusion I just stated, and the left-hand inclusion, that f inverse of n contains f inverse of this ball of radius epsilon about f of a, follows just from the fact that n contains the ball of radius epsilon about f of a, which is written at the top of the slide, and taking pre-images preserves inclusion. If you've got two sets a and b, and a contains b, then the set of points that lands up in b under the application of f is contained in the set of points that lands in a under the application of f. And so indeed, f inverse of n is a neighbourhood of a, because we've explicitly found a ball about a um, that also lies in f inverse of n. So that's the proof of the only if direction. Now let's look at the if direction. So suppose that f satisfies this neighbourhood pre-images property. So that's the, the property in, in the proposition. So now let epsilon be greater than zero and consider an open ball of radius epsilon about f of a. So this is an open set containing f of a. We proved that in the last lecture. And so it's certainly a neighbourhood of f of a. Um, and therefore, its pre-image, by assumption, is also a neighbor, is a, is a neighbourhood of A. Um, and that means, by definition of neighbourhood, that it contains some ball about A. So the pre-image under F of the ball of radius epsilon about F of A contains some ball of radius delta about A. Now, if you apply um, F to this, you come out with the statement that if X lies in the ball of radius delta about A, then f of x lays, lies in the ball of radius epsilon about f of a. And this is exactly the usual definition of what it means for a function to be continuous at a. So as I said, this proof was somewhat long, but everything was sort of almost just a, a sort of tautology. Everything's just working carefully through the definitions and the language, but no actual mathematics has happened somehow. It's just inclusions and language. But the result is quite non-trivial, so this let's just take another look at it. That proposition. So again, the usual definition of continu continuity of a function involves epsilons and deltas, points being close to one another and so on, and we've reformulated it in a manner that doesn't mention the distance, doesn't mention any deltas and epsilons. Of course, those are hidden inside the definition of neighbourhood, which itself requires the definition of open set, which requires the definition of an open ball, and that's where the epsilon's gone. But the proposition itself doesn't see any of that um, in its statement. And that's important for reasons that we'll come to at the end of this lecture. Now let's look at reformulating what it means for a function to be continuous at every point in much the same way. So let x and y be metric spaces and let f map x to y. Then the theorem is that f is continuous if and only if for every open set u in y f inverse of u is open in x. Now, as I said, I don't really like this notion of neighbourhoods, or at least I try to avoid using it. Um, this, to me, is the, the most basic theorem about the link between continuity and open sets. So not, it doesn't mention neighbourhoods, it only mentions the concept of open sets. Now, one could deduce this proposition from the previous one, but that would involve unpicking the definition of neighbourhood. So I'm going to just prove this again from first principles. So this proof will be quite parallel to the proof of the previous proposition. I don't think it hurts to go through this argument, a somewhat similar argument again. So suppose now that f is continuous at every point, and let u be an open subset of y. And now let me take an arbitrary point a in the pre-image of u. So certainly f of a lies in u, but u is an open set, and therefore some ball about f of a also lies in u. So let's call that ball the ball of radius epsilon about f of a. Now, by the usual epsilon delta definition of continuity, there is a delta positive such that if x lies in the ball of radius delta about a, then f of x lies in the ball of radius epsilon about f of a. That's just a reformulation of the usual definition of continuity, but using the language of balls instead of distance. It's exactly the same thing. Therefore, the inverse image of the ball of radius epsilon about f of a under f 
contains the ball of radius delta about a, because f of everything in that ball of radius delta winds up in the ball of radius epsilon. Therefore, I've got a similar chain of inclusions to the one I had a few slides ago. f inverse of u contains f inverse of the ball of radius epsilon, about f of a, um, because u contains the ball of radius epsilon about f of a, and pre-images preserve inclusions. But that in turn contains the ball of radius delta about a. Therefore, f inverse of u contains the ball of radius delta about a. a was an arbitrary point in f inverse of u in the pre-image of u, and so that pre-image is an open set. And then finally, let's look in the other direction. So we'll look at the if direction. Suppose that f satisfies the open set's pre-images property. So in other words, the pre-image of any open set is an open set. Now let's take a point A in X. Now let epsilon be greater than zero. The ball of radius epsilon about f of A is open. We showed that in the last lecture. And so by the assumption, by this open set's pre-images property, the pre-image of that ball under f is also open. So f inverse of that ball of radius epsilon about f of a is open. Now a clearly lies in that set because f of a lies in that ball of radius epsilon. And so, um, because it's an open set, there has to be a ball of radius delta about a that also lies in that set. The ball of radius delta about a is contained in f inverse, the pre-image under f, of the ball of radius epsilon about f of a. And then if you apply f to both sides of that, you get that f of the ball of radius delta about a is contained in the ball of radius epsilon about f of a. And that's exactly what it means for f to be continuous at a. So we've proved two very similar theorems, characterizing first of all continuity at a point, and then continuity everywhere in terms of first neighborhoods and then open sets. Let me make a few remarks about this. So by taking complements, you can quite easily show that equivalently, a map from X to Y is continuous if and only if, for every closed subset V of Y, the pre-image F inverse of V is a closed subset of X. I'll leave that as an exercise. Now here's something that's important. A continuous function need not map open sets to open sets. In fact, that's Kind of obvious. I mean, the constant function 1 is a continuous function uh, from R to R, and it maps all of R just to the point 1, which is not so. Uh, but here's another example, which is perhaps slightly less trivial. Consider the natural map that takes this, the half open interval from 0, 1 to the circle R mod Z. So what this does is it takes half open 0, 1 and identifies 1 with 0. So we map a point x in that interval to x modulo 1. So the half open interval from 0 to a half, that is an open set in the space half open 0, 1. Now remember that the, the notion of open is a relative notion. So I know this half open set from 0 up to a half doesn't look open. It's not open as a subset of R. But considered as a subset of 0 up to 1, it is open. Um, so the reason is that, I mean, there is a ball about 0, the, the ball about 0 of radius epsilon in the space half open 0, 1 is just a little interval to the right of 0. It doesn't see any of the rest of the real line. But the image of that set, so mapped into the circle R mod Z, the image of that set really does look like a half open interval. So this is a bijective continuous map where you have an open set that maps to a set that's not an open set. Now the rest of this lecture is not examinable, but I just wanted, this is the natural point to just point forward to the topology course and talk just a tiny bit about topological spaces because it's a discussion of the topological spaces that really motivates most of what this lecture was about. So here's the definition of a topological space. It's a set X 
together with a collection of sets U, and we just give them the name open sets, and they satisfy the following properties. So X and the empty set are open. This collection of sets is closed under arbitrary unions, and it's closed under finite intersections. Now, this is something that we've seen before. In fact, in the last lecture, we showed precisely that a metric space together with its actual open sets, which we defined carefully in the last lecture, satisfies these properties. So we can call that a theorem, in fact. So the main one of the results of lecture eight is that if you take a metric space together with its open sets, as we defined in lecture eight, then that space is a topological space with its collection of open sets being the open sets that we defined in lecture eight. So this is perhaps a little bit confusing. When you define a topological space, you don't, there's no notion of distance, no notion of ball or anything like that. You just declare some collection of sets to be the open sets. So there's no sense in which they look like open sets. And all you need to do is make sure that they satisfy these three properties. But it's compatible with the metric space notion of open set by the result we proved last time. So a metric space has the structure of a topological space. OK, well, what's the point of me saying this? Well, now that we've characterized what a continuous function is purely in terms of open sets, we can extend the definition of continuous function to topological spaces. And here's that definition. So suppose X and Y are two topological spaces. Then we say that a map F from X to Y is continuous if and only if for every open set U in Y, the inverse image F inverse of U is open in X. So in a topological space, there's no notion of distance and it's still possible to formulate what a continuous function is without reference to any notion of distance. So this now doesn't come with the intuition of taking somehow nearby points to nearby points. That doesn't make sense in an arbitrary topological space. But that's the reason behind us having recast the definition of continuous function in terms of open sets. So as I said, you'll hear much more about topological spaces in the designated course on topology. So this is lecture 10 of the metric spaces course. And in this lecture, we're going to look at just one topic, which is how the notion of open set and of open ball interact with the idea of a subspace of a metric space. So let's just quickly go over what a subspace is again. So let X be a metric space with metric D. And remember that if Y is a subset of X, then you can give Y the structure of a metric space by restricting the distance function to Y. So more formally, from X cross X to Y cross Y. Now, it becomes very pedantic to refer to that distance function on y as something like the restriction of d to y cross y. And it's completely standard to use the letter d for both metrics. And there's no real danger of confusion from doing that. It is important to remember, though, that the balls in y are quite different things to the balls in x. So the y ball centered on a point of and of radius r is the set of all things in y whose distance from the center point is less than r, whereas the x ball is the set of all things in x whose distance from the center point is less than r. And in general, that will be a much bigger set. So the y ball is contained in the x ball, but in general, they're not the same thing. In fact, the y ball, I think it's clear from what I've written here, is the intersection of the x ball with capital Y. So let's look at a couple of examples. Suppose that x is the Euclidean plane, r squared, and that y is the subspace consisting just of the x-axis. So r cross the point zero, the set of all things whose y-coordinate is zero. Then the x-ball centered on the origin and with radius one is just an open unit disk of radius one. But the y-ball centered on the origin and with radius one is just a line segment uh, from minus one up to one on the x-axis. And an important thing to observe here is that that y-ball, although of course it's an open set in y, is not an open set in x. So the notion of open is a relative notion. So the y-ball is open in y, 
that when considered as a subset of x, it's not open. Let's look at another example. Take x to be the real line and y to be this set. So it's a half open interval from 0 to 1, with 0 not included, but with 1 included, together with the closed interval 2, 3. And consider the set U that consists just of the half open interval from 0 to 1. Now considered as a subset of X, that is to say of the reals, U is not open because none of the X balls centered on 1 are contained in U. But considered as a subset of Y, it is open. U is open. And for instance, the ball of radius, the Y ball of radius 1 half about 1, so that consists of all points in Y at distance strictly less than a half from 1. That is just the half open, half open interval from a half up to 1. It doesn't get anywhere near the closed interval 2, 3. It's just the half open interval from a half up to 1, which is contained in U. And um, therefore, so U is open as a subset of Y. Let's prove a general lemma about the nature of open sets in subspaces. So the lemma is that all of the open sets in Y are obtained by intersecting open sets in X with Y. So more formally, let X be a metric space and take a subspace Y of it. Then a set U contained in Y is open in Y, if and only if there's an open set V in X such that u is y intersected with v. Let's prove that. The two things to prove, the if and the only if. Let's do the if first. So suppose first that u is the intersection of y with a set v that's open in x. Uh, let's take a point little y in u. Now little y is certainly in v and v is open and so some x ball about little y is contained in v. If I intersect that X ball with capital Y, well, what I get is the Y ball of the same radius and the same center, and that's now contained in U. So for an arbitrary point little Y in U, I found a Y ball centered on that point with positive radius that's still contained in U, and that's what it means for U to be open. Now let's look at the only if direction. So suppose that U is open in Y, and I want to exhibit U as the intersection of Y with an open set in V. For each point little y in U, I can find a positive radius, epsilon sub Y, such that the Y ball about little y with that radius is contained in U. So that's what it means for U to be open. Now the union of all of those balls is precisely U. They're all contained in U, as I've just said, and moreover, each point of U is contained in the ball centered on that point. And so these two things are equal. So now let's take V to be the union of all of the X balls with the same centers and the same radius. But now they're X balls instead of Y balls. And then one can just check um, quite straightforwardly the intersection of this set V, so V is certainly open because it's a, an R, it's a union of X balls, which are all open sets in X. And the intersection of this set V with Y uh, is just the union of all of the corresponding Y balls again, which is just equal to U. And so that concludes the proof of the lemma. Let me finish this lecture with just a few remarks. So the result that I just stated is also, there's an analogue of it with closed in place of open. So if I've got a subspace Y of a metric space X, uh, a set Z is closed in Y, if and only if, it's the intersection of a closed set F in X with Y. And that follows, in fact, from the result for open sets by taking complements. And then finally, a non-examinable remark for those of you who followed the non-examinable comments on topological spaces that I made at the end of the last lecture. So the consequence of the lemma 
on the last slide is that I can tell you what the open sets in Y are just in terms of what the open sets in X are. So they are the open sets in Y are just the intersections of the open sets in X with Y. So there's no reference there to the metric or balls or distances. And what this means is that you can define um, the structure of a topological space on Y. So this works in without knowing that X is a metric space. So if X is just a topological space, we define the open sets of Y to be the intersection of the open sets in X with Y. So that's a definition, but by the lemma on the last slide, it coincides in the metric space case with what the open sets on Y are in the sense of metric spaces. So don't worry too much about that. You'll cover that in a lot more detail in the topology course. But I just wanted to say that um, as a sort of motivation for um, stating the lemma on the last slide.